so he has encoded and we shall decode and as you decode please tweet please using the hashtag the platform ng 2022 please it's absolutely important that those of us who are not here get this message so please go ahead whenever you post a message about the platform today please use the platform ng 2022 our next speaker is kadria ahmed Kadri Ahmed is a leading Nigerian journalist, yes, and media entrepreneur. She sits on the Nigerian Board of Trustees of the International Press Institute and has been recognized as one of the five most influential people in the Nigerian media landscape. Kadria is a recipient of grants in support of her work in accountability journalism from leading donor agencies, including the Ford Foundation and the MacArthur Foundation. She is the executive director of Daria Media, a company whose focus is on public service journalism. She's also the managing director of Radio Now 95.3, which broadcasts out of Lagos. Radio Now exists to provide factual, unbiased, and Nigeria-focused media products that empower citizens to hold power accountable, build social consciousness, and promote nation building. Kadria's passion for public service journalism is driven by a creed to confront inequality, injustice, and the pitfalls of identity politics. As a result, she has created and produced and anchored programs through which she has set the agenda for national conversations on significant issues and at times influenced policy. She has written extensively and has published in national and international newspapers, including the Daily Trust, the Guardian, Premium Times, to mention a few. She is a member of the Nigerian Guild of Editors and the Nigerian Institute of Directors. She started her career at the BBC in London, and Kadere has an MA in television from Goldsmiths University of London and a bachelor's degree from the University of Bayou University Kano, she is a Chevening scholar. Please welcome me, welcome warmly rather, Kadra Ahmed. So, standing here, being silent for a little while, I can already feel people being a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> we don't like being silent. Silence forces us to look inwards. It forces us to sit with ourselves and it forces us to think uncomfortable thoughts. The answers of some of those thoughts we're not quite sure we would like. And so we run away from silence. The minute you know, things start being a little bit quiet, what happens is that we begin to fidget, we move around. I'm in a space of the church. So allow me for a minute to try and stand in the shoes of Pastor Oyemade. I know they're big shoes. I know they're big shoes. Bear with me. I want to just tap a little bit into the scripture. Okay? Psalms 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I can see the brains thinking she's crazy. <laughs> what has this got to do with Nigeria and leadership and what we're here to talk about? Bear with me a little and you will understand. You see, 
We are all being asked to look at the nuts and bolts of nation building today as we mark 62 years of independence from colonial rule. We're being asked to come up with a blueprint, one that we believe can save this country if implemented by leaders we are going to elect a few months from now. Truth be told, I do not think it's that simple. I really don't. To understand why I believe it isn't that simple or straightforward, allow me to delve a little bit into this issue of leadership. Is there anyone in this room who doesn't believe that Nigeria has a leadership problem? Anyone? That's right. I think it's the one thing that perhaps nationally we are all agreed nationally we have a consensus that this country has a death of leadership at all levels political leadership yes but also the problem has permeated all sectors although undoubtedly the deficit in political leadership has perhaps the most significant bearing on our fate as a country. Our political and electoral systems appear to always throw up candidates without the requisite skills and the required character to provide quality leadership in national, state, and local government. And this with very serious consequences for the country. I'm sure I don't need to remind anyone here of the rampaging non-state actors that are causing mayhem and chaos and holding this country hostage. No, about our largely unproductive economy, or unbridled corruption, and almost complete and total lack of accountability, lack of fiscal discipline, and a myriad of all factors that have combined over successive years to culminate in us now being flat on our back. As we see rising inflation has eroded income for the few that are employed, poverty is galloping, leading to endemic hunger and death, and yes, we're talking literal deaths. So, in the independent Nigeria of 62 years ago, I think overall people were hopeful that they could build a country that they would all be proud of. And in those early days, prosperity, abundance, and peace all seemed very possible. Today, Nigeria's promise of affluence and a better future has been realized. Yes, it has. But only for a handful who have made tremendous gains living in affluence and luxury, a number of them making this money from the Commonwealth at the expense of ordinary people. For the majority, Nigeria today is simply not working. The most basic of things that are taken for granted in other places have eluded us. Our children die from drinking bad water. They die from a lack of basic health care. They are not given an education or any sort of skill to navigate a fast-changing, knowledge-based world. But worst of all, none of us here can be guaranteed even basic security. I need you to pause for a minute and think about what that does to the national psyche. When every time you go out, you're terrified. And this happens even in the most fluent of, um, affluent of places like Lagos. You're worried about your car being smashed and things being grabbed. For those of us in places like Zamfara, the fear is much worse than that because we could literally go out and never be found again. Taken either to be killed, raped, or for our girls forced to marry 
the people who are responsible for taking them away from their families. It is pretty horrific, the life of a lot of Nigerians in this country today. So how did we get here? And I don't want to hear President Muhammad Buhari. <laughs> the reason I say that is because that then begets another question. How did we end up with him? And truth be told, Nigerians have generally been shortchanged regardless of which of the two parties that have been ruling this country have been in power. I want to pause for a minute before we tackle that big issue and tell you a small story. It won't take too long. If in May you happened to be in the Indonesian city of Malang during the Muslim Eid festival, you would have seen Muslims flock to the backyard of a Catholic church, which is located right next to the city's Grand Mosque, flocking there to say their Eid prayer. Because you see, what has happened over the years in that town is that every time there's a big gathering or big prayer, communal prayer, and the mosque cannot contain the people, the church will open its doors. And the Muslims will go there and pray. And they reciprocate. Because when Christmas comes, they are on car duty. Making sure, and I'm here talking about the Muslims are on car duty. Making sure that their Muslim brothers and sisters can actually attend mass and that there's no chaos. So they act as valets for the cars. This quid pro quo of harmonious religious existence exemplifies Indonesia's national motto, Bineka Tungal Ika, meaning unity in diversity. I've chosen to focus briefly on Indonesia because it has some similarities to Nigeria. A large population, 250 million people to be precise, Diverse religions, there are Indonesian Muslims, Indonesian Christians, Indonesian Buddhists, and Hindus, and other smaller sects. For a long time, well over 30 years, Indonesia was ruled by a corrupt dictator. I'm sure a few people here will remember Suharto who ruled for over, like I said, three decades until economic problems forced him to resign in 1998. Indonesia, like Nigeria, has also battled with religious extremism and continues to grapple with income inequality and even corruption. I'm saying all this so you understand. I have honed in on Indonesia, not because I think it is a perfect society, but because I think they are dealing with essentially some of the issues that Nigeria is dealing with. But, and it is a big but, Indonesia has introduced major changes, including constitutional ones. It has decentralized power and given the regions greater autonomy while watering down the power of the president at the center. Something that I know you all agree we desperately need to do in this country. It has pursued relatively successful policies on fighting religious extremism and continues to deepen tolerance among its many tribes and religions, remaining true to its national motto. By focusing on manufacturing and services to ensure it does not remain dependent on commodities, which were the mainstay of its economy, which is now the 18th largest economy in the world, Indonesia has moved its people out of poverty. Their growth is being driven, not by anything external, but by local consumption from a growing middle class. But you see, 
Indonesia has something we don't. They all pull in the same direction. They are clear that they want a country that works for all. And so, their diversity is not taking the place of their unity. Instead, it complements it. I say this because I know that here in Nigeria today, unity has become a dirty word. When you talk about unity, people tell you it's because your place is poor and you're busy collecting oil from other people. And that is why you are thinking about unity. Forgetting that Nigeria does not belong to only the Igbos, Hausa, Fulanis, and Yorubas. And that we have a lot of minority tribes who, in reality, will function better in a larger functional country. Justice is more likely for your minorities in a place that is big, diverse, but which is working. And I agree, Nigeria is not working now. So, in essence, what am I saying? That the ingredient that is missing in our journey is unity of purpose. Without agreeing on the basics, we are not getting anywhere. The road is not easy. No, it's full of obstacles. I can see them. Everybody can see them. But it is clear. What do I mean? If I stand here today and I see nation over there, I can get there. I know I can get there. But I have to do some serious work. If we battle and stay true to that road, the destination is nationhood. But you can't have a nation unless you all come together. Without unity, we cannot hold our elected officials and other public office holders accountable. They will keep playing us from religion to ethnicity. Every possible point of difference will be used and exploited to divide us. So we cannot speak with one voice and demand that the right things are done. Identity politics are a scourge in Nigeria. They really are. They have stopped us from seeing each other's humanity. They make us imagine that we are really, really that different, but we are not. I've traveled across this country and I have deep, meaningful relationships with people from diverse places. My children are Yoruba. They are Adeshidas from the Deji of Adeshidas family. I have childhood friends that I grew up with that are from Enugu and Imo. And these are places that I've visited regularly. And I know that when I sit down with them, the conversation is always about what they want and what they want tends to be the same. They want to live safely. They want to be able to earn a legitimate living, have dignity in their labor, look after their children. Whether this is Zamfara or Umoahia or Ondo, it is the same thing. And so when we keep insisting on demonizing each other and looking at each other as if we are different. I say to you, it's not true. How hating another poor man who is just like you, going through the same troubles as you, because he speaks a different language or worships differently, will make your life better or help build a better nation, is not quite clear to me. What I do know is that it is an old divide and root trick. And shockingly, 
Shockingly, it continues to be effective among Nigerians, even the most educated among us. Meanwhile, the issues we face as a country continue to damage each and every person, regardless of tribe or creed. When I was young, my dad taught us a lesson, and I imagine it's a lesson that has been taught in every household, at least my generation. It's a lesson found in books, parables, and folk tales. And maybe you will laugh, but I brought that lesson here with me today. I cannot. And I think even if I call up the men and tell them to break this for me, they cannot. <laughs> oh yeah, Shagun, come and break it. Come and break it. Right? But you take one and it's easy. I know all of you have had that lesson taught to you at different times. Even if it is to teach you We're easily broken when we stand alone and strong when we're together. And I'm insisting we are one people despite our diversity. The notion of us being the same people regardless of this illusion of separateness is very evident as soon as we leave our borders. We are always recognized as Nigerians. And this becomes even more stark when we move outside the continent, because we become black people. We don't see it and accept it, and we pay a high price for that. But the world, of, the world sees us as one, and more importantly, will continue to treat us as one. We are a conquered people who are refusing to now use the opportunities to rise and take our rightful place among respected people of this earth. We somehow think we can do well, while others among us are doing badly. Perish that thought. Until we all do well, we're all going to continue doing badly. And those of you who travel, who mix with people from other places, know exactly what I'm talking about. But beyond even the optics, we pay a high price for constantly putting our diversity ahead of our unity. History is a good teacher. The warring tribes of Europe didn't begin to enjoy long-term peace and prosperity on an unprecedented scale until they recognized that essentially they were subcultures within a larger dominant culture. We must come together if we're to ever going to be a nation. Nigeria cannot and will not fulfill its promise until we are all one and traveling together. We're in a leaky boat that is threatening to capsize and kill all of us. And if we do not work together to plug the holes to enable us to reach shore where perhaps we can build a new boat, then we are all doomed. And listen, I'm not talking about holding hands and singing kumbaya, <laughs> okay? I'm talking about a common acceptance of the rule of law, justice for all, fairness and equity, equal opportunity and discipline, values from which we can forge a common future that give us all and those coming after the chance at a better life. A life of affluence and respect, of accomplishment and fulfillment. I've traveled across Nigeria, like I said, and I know that all of us in the end want the same thing. And yes, within the borders of Nigeria, all this is possible. But I'm also saying, you must give up some personal comfort for the benefit of the whole. Understanding that that tanker of stolen oil, which has enabled your family to travel the world, is contributing to destabilizing the same country and jeopardizing the life of generations unborn. <laughs> Knowing that every time a terrorist is caught and you start your whataboutism, 
you are driving a nail into the coffin of rule of law and prompting impunity. Remembering that every cobo stolen that is meant for IDPs means death from malnutrition and hunger for an innocent child. Many of us, especially among the political class, the elites have gotten comfortable with rottenness. We have become part of the decay, even if we don't realize it. We partake in storytelling that is untrue, but which provides us with comfort because, well, the truth sometimes is too hard to face. We blame Kano's, youth, uh, Kano's drug problem on the beleaguered people in Anambra and the lack of drinking water in Abia on the poverty-stricken people of Zamfara. A few years ago, we managed to convince ourselves that Boko Haram terrorists are a problem only for the Northeast and have nothing to do with Abuja and Ondo. I am saying, it is time to be still. It is time to pause, to think, to reflect and retrospect, and to be totally honest with ourselves. It will mean difficult conversations. It will mean working hard to heal divisions and wounds, and not just from the civil war, although that would be a good starting point but also the many wars that have since followed. It will mean making commitment to building a nation. It will mean sacrifice. It will be hard work because, well, nation building requires deliberate, intentional work, and that doesn't come easy. To do this, we require a quality leader. For me, our next president cannot, should not, and must not pay lip service to this question of unity. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate you, ma'am. Thank you.